Uh, the food list is in the office if you haven't uh, uh, signed or whatever to offer to bring some things. So you can check with either Patsy or Linda. Uh, there they uh, know the menu and what's being done. Any special prayer requests? I have one for a family member who began her chemo today. And uh, we need to pray for her. Uh, her name is Maggie. She's a rather new believer. And um, uh, she has uh, breast cancer. You'll remember her in prayer in Tampa. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord and prepare and prepare ourselves also for the study of God's word tonight. Thank you, Father, for this time together in the Word. We thank you for each one who's here. We pray that as this message goes out here in this congregation and via the YouTube and the Internet that you would draw hearers to it. We pray, Father, for Maggie as she takes her chemo today as taking it. We pray you'd cause it to be effective, can be within your will. We pray for the needs of our people. We have in the military, and their protection, and their provision, their spiritual growth. So many of our folks have gone through difficult times recently and are experiencing difficult things, and we commit them to you and ask for your divine wisdom and guidance in their lives. And we ask, Father, also for illumination as we study your word tonight, that we might understand that portion of scripture that you have placed for us to be nourished by. So we commit these things to you in Christ's name. Amen. You're in First Peter the first, fifth chapter and the seventh verse. I had put on the screen, I was uh, thinking I was going to teach in July on the fo around the fourth, so I put a quote from Samuel Adams there. We're not advertising a beverage. Uh, if you love wealth better than liberty, the tranquility of servitude, than the animating contest of freedom... Go from us in peace. He's castigating, he's chastising the members of Congress. We ask not your counsels or arms. Crouch down and lick the hands which feed you. That's pretty strong talk. Well, it's still happening today, isn't it? Things haven't changed a whole lot. All right. Well, we've been studying the second paragraph in 1 Peter in chapter 5. And you recall this is instructions to the local churches. There are pastors, verses 5 and 6, uh, and then the congregation, 6 and 7, 8, and so forth, to the end. Now, in our last several studies, we've been focusing on this verse, and I'm not stuck. I am going to move on, but it's a very important passage of Scripture because it, it's something that we just don't, you know, unless we're really hurting bad, we just, God, I'll take care of this myself. Isn't that human nature? I, I just, you know, or, or we, I mean, we may not say that, but we tend to act that way about it. By the way, is, is the air on? Can you all tell? You do? Okay, good. Is this side, is it on? You, okay, okay, that's fine. Thank you. Let's read the text while we cool off. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders. And all of you, clothe yourself with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The command. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. Casting all your anxiety upon him, because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. Now, we've been studying this phrase, casting your anxieties upon him. It's the fulfillment of the command in verse 6, to humble ourselves under the ruling or the almighty hand of God. It's part of the process of humbling. If you're not casting your burdens upon the Lord, you can, you're not growing in the aspect of 
humbling yourself before the Lord. Because really what you're saying is, I can take care of my own situations. I'm sufficient for my own problems, for my own needs. You're not humbling yourselves under God's authority. And God cannot exalt a believer who isn't humbled. God will not exalt a believer and promote a believer spiritually and materially who is arrogant. Now, as we increase in our dependency on God's sufficiency for our own inadequacies, and sometimes we don't want to admit them, you know, those inadequacies just might diminish. <laughs> we might become more aware of it. It's not that we don't have those same tendencies, but we're more aware and we're more sensitive and, and we're clued into the fact that if, this is, if I'm going down this road, there's a tendency for me to do this. And it increases our strength and confidence in the Lord when we see him dealing with us in these things. Oh, why does God want us to tell him all the problems we have? Why does God want us to cast our cares on him? Because it matters to him. <laughs> it matters to him. He cares how it is with us. And our problems and our cares matter to him. Now, the Lord already knows all about them, doesn't he? He knew about our cares and our problems before we ever had them, before we ever existed. But he wants us to come to him. I've heard people say, well, I don't need to pray about that because God already knows about it. You know, there's folks that say, I don't need to give them the gospel. If they're going to get saved, they're going to get saved. And if they're not going to get saved, they're not going to get saved. Now, the Lord wants us to bring our, our cares to him, to cast them on him. Why? Because that's the way we develop and receive from him humility of soul. And what happens when we have humility of soul? Well, we're grace-oriented. We're applying truth, so we're doctrinally oriented. And we're grace-oriented. And that affects the way we think of ourselves, the way we think of others, in the, in the body and out of the body of Christ. So God doesn't say, just come to me with your big issues, or you can only bring ten problems today. He doesn't quanti you know, quantify how many we can do. Nor does he say only the significant ones or put them in this category, A, B, or C. And today, I'll, you know, it's the Saturday special at Goodwill, so all the orange tabs are 99 cents. That's a, I learned that from Dan McDonald today. It pays to go to men's prayer meeting. You learn something. <laughs> but you know, he just says, bring your, bring your cares. Casting your cares upon him because it matters to him. Well, this brought to our attention. Casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. That's why we're doing it. Now, there's some things that we're to consider. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But what are we to do? We're to resist him in your faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. And we've already looked in detail the verses that deal with casting all your anxiety, and I put all in gold, and cares in gold, because we fail often to do that very thing. One of the hardest things, I think, for people to understand is that when God says all, he means all. And it's, it's, it's like the word eternal. So, so many folks get hung up on the word eternal. They think it's temporary. You know, you say, are you saved? Well, I hope so. But, you know, I've sinned a lot since I accepted Christ, so I don't know. So, in other words, what you're saying is your eternal life is no longer eternal. It's just temporary until you sin. 
And there are a lot of folks that think that way. No, God says all. Eternal is eternal. He cares for us. So what I want us to do tonight as we bring verse 7 to a close, and it'll take me about 30 minutes to close, let's look at a summary of faith rest. One of the things that we have to decide in resting in the Lord is who's going to do the work? Am I going to do the work or let God do the work? And God's a gentleman. He says, you know, Harry, if you want to do the work, have at it. You want to beat your head against the stone, against the rocks? Go ahead. See what happens. You get all these scars. Or you can let me do it. Now, God says, you know, I've already shown, I've already demonstrated to you my rest. Didn't you read of it in the book of Genesis? In chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their hosts. And by the seventh day God completed his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. He said, I've already done everything. Having done it all. I have rest. Now, isn't it interesting that God created, provided for Adam and Eve everything that they needed spiritually and physically before they were ever created? <laughs> before they were created. The Sabbath rest demonstrated God's total grace provision. I thought this was neat when I came to the Holy Spirit brought it to my thinking. Apart from man's effort or presence. They weren't even there. But yet God had provided everything spiritually and physically that they would need. Now, so what happens? They, they come along and I don't know how long they were enjoying fellowship with the Lord. I, I hope it was for a good while. Knowing Satan, how quickly he came, we'll get to it uh, in a little bit, uh, how quickly he visited Peter after Peter made his beautiful statement, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. I doubt that Satan waited too long to show up in the garden, but maybe he did. But remember when they sinned, what did they do? They said, we got to fix this. My goodness, our lights are gone. Our lights are all out. Throw the breakers. No breakers to throw. The divine light that they were shrouded in and clothed in was gone. They were separated from God because of their sin. Well, we'll fix that. Let's get the biggest leaves we can find and sew them together. And at least uh, have a semblance of clothing. You know the Lord, you know the story. You know the facts. How the Lord came in the garden. And he offered them a remedy. He clothed them upon faith in Christ, the coming Christ, in the righteousness symbolized by the skins. He instituted the innocent animal dying for the guilty, a symbol of the Lamb of God who would come and take away the sins of the world. God instituted it, the policy of grace. They didn't deserve it. They had everything in perfection. I mean, what more could you want, ladies, and men, it would, what more could we want? It was, everything was perfect. And yet they blew it. They chose to go against God. But God comes in grace. And he makes it so that it's not a matter of effort but a volitional choice to exercise faith in what was presented to them as the remedy for sin. It was probably the greatest sermon ever preached, the greatest witness encounter ever in human history when the Lord Jesus Christ himself presents to them the fact that they need a Savior. And we know that by faith they accepted it. 
Did they know about the cross? I don't think that's an issue we need to worry about. The cross was something in the future. They knew that an animal had to be slain as a picture of the innocent dying for the guilty. Old Testament did say, cursed is the one who hangs on a tree, and the cross was referred to as a tree. In retrospect, we know a lot of things. But what they needed to know, and all that they needed to know, and as much as God wanted them to know, they knew. And they acted upon it by faith. And we can say that they believed in the future death of Christ. The future death of the Lamb of God dying for the sins of the world. Now, you, today, you and I look back. We believe what? In the Christ who died on the cross for our sins. We look backwards. So we're in the past tense. We look back. But either way, whether looking toward the cross or looking back to the cross, there's one element that is always missing and must be missing. And that's works. Any kind of work on your behalf or my behalf or by you or by me nullifies grace. Romans teaches that. Romans says, look, if it's of works, it's works. If it's by grace, it's not of works. If there's works in it, then it's no longer grace. And that's very serious that we know that and that we make that issue very, very clear in witnessing. Because so many people think they have to put, as the pastor says, their oar in the water. You know, they got, they got to add their little two cents. I got to help God. That's human tendency. Why? Because that's the sin nature working. That's how the sin nature works. Hey, God, let me help you. But when they exercise their faith toward the future Christ who would die for their sins, and when we exercise our faith toward the Christ who died and was buried and rose again for our sins, we have eternal life just like they did. Well, how clear could Paul make it in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9? For by grace are you saved. You've been saved through faith. Then not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, not of the result of works, not of anything that you can do, that no one should boast. And I've always thought, you know, if I could just add my two cents, then I can boast about my two cents. And God says, no, it's not going to be that way. Third thing I want you to see is that God has to be the one that makes the payment for sin. For we're all sinners by nature. We're sinners by choice. We're born with a sin nature. We have to that nature imputed the, the uh, sin of Adam. And we choose to produce personal sins. And God is perfect. And God isn't interested in how close you come to perfection. God, God says, you must have my righteousness. But isn't it true and wonderful? Romans 5, 8. God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, I like that. Not when we got ourselves squeaky clean and got our act together and got all these things, you know, and all our ducks in a row. Uh-uh. While we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. See, it doesn't matter if you get all your ducks in a row. Do you have all the ducks? <laughs> Do you have, uh, is it a home run if the guy catches it by leaning over the fence and catching the ball? No, it's just a big out. But God demonstrates his love while we're yet sinners. Christ died for us. Isn't it wonderful there? That's for Adam and Eve and for you and I. That the basis, the remedy for our sins is simple faith in Christ. And yet so many people say, that's too simple. Well, 
And it's, I won't talk about you. But thank God it's that simple for me. <laughs> or I'd mess up. <laughs> Galatians 2.16 tells us, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Well, how are we going to live the Christian life? Well, we're going to hustle for God. Really? You couldn't hustle to get saved. <laughs> you couldn't work to get saved. What makes you think that you can work to be spiritual? It's not an effort of spiritual, of, of, of effort. Does that mean there's no effort in the Christian life? That there's no production? Well, there's lots of production, but hopefully it's not by our sin natures producing, but rather God the Holy Spirit producing in and through us. There's a difference. What's our challenge? To learn God's word? We, we live the Christian life by faith. Listen, it's a supernatural life. You know that. How can you live a supernatural life with, with natural means? <laughs> for it, Romans 1.17, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It is written, But the righteous man shall live by faith. Quotation from Hosea. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. So we know that the necessity of living an effective Christian life is being filled with the Spirit so that you can learn the Word of God, and so that you can apply the Word of God to the various circumstances of life. And this requires a certain mental attitude of eagerness. You can't be complacent and say, well, God, you know, shove it down my throat. No, we have to be eager to learn the Word. We have to be eager to trust. And yes, we have to be persistent, disciplined, in our pursuit of spiritual things. So we're going to see that in the succeeding verses, and I don't want to get too much ahead of myself. Verses 8, he's, Peter's going to talk about some things that we need to be aware, our responsibilities, in seeing to it that we don't get derailed as a Christian. But Psalm 119, remember Psalm 119 is the, the Psalm the death march, probably Ezra's father, but he's a young man at this point. Most of those folks didn't make it, you know. They would, they were with ropes and they, they, they die, they just hack them off the rope and keep, keep going on. He says, I diligently consider thy testimonies. I diligently See, it's not casual. Well, let's see. <clears throat> if I have time today, I'll try to read my Bible. If I can find it. <laughs> and then where are my glasses? That's if you're over 40. <laughs> I diligently. There was an urge... <clears throat> there was an insistence within him, an internal energy that says, I must pursue the Word of God. Proverbs 8, 17, the Lord says, I love those who love me, and those who diligently seek me will find me. And Paul writing to Colossians, whatever you do, do it heartily. Don't be a bum. Don't 
just pull time, act like you're working, do it heartily. <coughs> but, listen to, did you catch the next phrase? As for the Lord, see, rather than for men. You want to do what you do, do it heartily, but make sure you're doing it in fellowship for the Lord. Because how, what, what do others do? Well, they do it for men ple to please men. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're working, if you're an employee, that you shouldn't work diligently for your boss. You should. But your motivation is what? Doing it for the Lord. That's the motivation behind it. And you do your job as unto the Lord. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For it's the Lord Christ whom you serve. So when you and I are about doing our business, whether it's at home, making the bed, whether it's on the job, adjusting eyeglasses, whether it's out in a field, working, farming, studying to teach the Word of God, what are we to do? We're to do it diligently. Because ultimately, we're serving the Lord. Now what happens when our faith doesn't go in that direction? What happens when our faith is weak? How can we expect to rest in the Lord and see him do work in our lives? Well, we can't. <laughs> we might want, expect him to, but he's not going to. I'm reminded of the disciples, Matthew, the eighth chapter. Now, I think the disciples are rather young in their faith at this point. This is probably early in the, in the Lord's ministry. And when he got into the boat, this is the Lord, his disciples followed him. Now, he's already told them what he's going to do. We're going over there. You know. And behold, there arose a great storm in the sea, so that the boat was covered with waves, and Jesus was asleep. And he himself was asleep. What a beautiful picture. <laughs> what a beautiful picture. He had already said, look, hey, guys, we're going over there. We're going to the other side. I'm going to go take a nap. We've just had nice cake and all these refreshments that we've just ate and and it's hard to stand on our feet and be awake. The Lord says, I'm going to take a nap. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're perishing. Now, how can you perish when the Lord says, we're going over there? And he said to them, why are you timid, you men of little faith? Well, that, that's a mild, that's really kind of a mild statement, isn't it? He could have said a whole lot of harsher things to them, but he didn't. Then he arose and he rebuked the winds. Notice, he rebuked the winds in the sea. He didn't chew them out. He just called them to their senses. Get, get a reality check. And it became perfectly calm. And the men just marvel, saying, oh my goodness, what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Well, they not only obey him, they're the same ones, it's the same God who said we're going to the other side. The winds and the waves could not destroy them. Say, well, what, what would have happened if, if they'd been swamped overboard and drowned? 
Well, the Lord just had to prepare another fish and Jonah would be in the New Testament and spit them out across the other side. See, they failed in such basic things as, did you really hear what I said? We're going to go over there. But they were weak. Well, they grew up. Let's give them credit. They grew up. But a lot of bumps along the way, as they did. Notice that Hebrews 11.6 tells us, look, without faith, impossible. Impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he is rewarder of those who seek them. And then the eighth thing I think we need to recognize is that whether we like it or not, whether you would wish that God had come in another way, he didn't ask your opinion or mine, spiritual growth only comes through perception of the word as it is taught under the authority of the teacher and the filling of the spirit and strengthened by testing. Oh, well, why do I have to take a test? Well, now, come on. We've all been to school. Until you get a test, you know, you really don't know it. And if you don't know it, you're going to have to learn it or you're going to flunk it again. It's, it's a way of strengthening your knowledge. Pressures and anxieties in life that come our way, when we cast them on the Lord, give us rest. Give us peace in our soul. And it puts spiritual muscle in our spiritual lives. So we have someone like James come along and say, look, just consider it all joy. <laughs> My brethren, when you encounter various trials, consider it joy. James, you don't understand. Yeah, I've been there too, James says. Consider it joy knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. See, God wants you to, and I to be good for the long haul till he calls us home. He doesn't want us to quit. He doesn't want us to punt on third down. He wants us to endure by his strength, to rest in his peace. And we're not going to do that if everything is hunky-dory all the time. <laughs> Let's face it, we're human. If we didn't have problems, a lot of us, us, okay, us, me, we might never bother to seek the Lord and call for help. You got money in the bank, you got this, you got that, you got the other. God, I'll see you when I need to. No, the testing of your faith. First Peter puts it so beautifully. Peter started his epistle. You remember me teaching you this verse four years ago? <laughs> Verses six through nine. That was supposed to make you laugh a little bit. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, You've been distressed in various trials. That the proof of your faith. And this is very important. The proof of your faith. Being more precious than gold which is perishable. Even though tested by fire. May be found to result in praise and glory and honor. At the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him. You love him. The eyes of faith. And though you do not see him now, you believe in him. Because he has said so in his word. You greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Obtaining as the outcome of your faith, the deliverance of your souls. In other words, God says, I'm going to see to it that you get through this. So, let's bring verse, this paragraph to a close. 
Let's do a quick summary of the subject of humility that we've been studying. You know, there ought to be a certain camaraderie in this body of believers. A feeling toward one another that's devoid of pride, that's, that's devoid of arrogance, that is marked by a gracious spirit A humble spirit. A non-judgmental spirit. A supporting spirit. A nurturing spirit. And if we fail to do that, then we are in trouble because we forget that God resists the proud. But He gives grace to the humble. This congregation should manifest the grace of God. We should manifest to one another a spirit of graciousness and humility. Because in that God can bless. Remember what just God says, I can promote, I can bless that you as an individual when you have that in your life should be a congregation that casts its anxieties on the Lord, knowing that He always cares for us. It matters to Him what happens to you. It matters to Him what happens to me. Life is going to have certain adversities, certain complexities, certain good things and certain bad things. They all matter to the Lord. Now, He knows all about them. That's why it matters to him, because he's looking to see how are we going to handle them. As we heard Sunday, the, one of the biggest tests that we flunk is the test of prosperity. Everything's okay. God, I don't, thank you. Now I'll go on with it by myself from here on out. What you don't realize is you're at the top of the hill and it's down all the way because you're on the slippery slope down. You see, our humility demonstrates our dependence upon God. So point one, we need to be free from pride and have a grace attitude toward one another. Two, remember God doesn't bless. God resists the proud. He makes war against the proud. Gives grace to the humble. He does care for us. It matters to him what goes on in our life. Therefore, he wants us to bring the matters to him. And the fourth point, it demonstrates our dependence upon God. Point five, humility is a prerequisite for God promoting the believer. Remember, we studied that. He says, casting your cares upon him, the command is to humble yourself. We're to cast the, our cares upon him, our demonstration of his dependence, of our dependence on him. And when we do that, God then is able to increase what he pours into the cup, the cup of blessing. We use the word capacity. Increase capacity for blessing. Now, you and I know that the worst thing that can happen in a business is for, for a person to get promoted that doesn't have the capacity to handle the job. And we've all seen that. Uh, I've seen it as a teacher, I've, as, as an administrator. Uh, sometimes, you know, the promotion doesn't come from you and you're bypassed and it comes from higher up and it's just a nightmare. Somebody sitting in an office 500 miles away decides Podunk over here is going to now be the head honcho or this thing. And it's a disaster. God doesn't promote unless we're ready for it. God doesn't promote unless we're ready and can handle it. Spiritually and materially. 
He doesn't put, God, God isn't in the business of having us fail. Okay? That sometimes you'll see that in businesses and, and other places. They set you up to fail. That's not godly. God desires you to advance forward, to move forward. His exaltation and promotion, generally and foremost, I believe, is spiritual. I think God opens doors. I really appreciated your article this week about how God opened doors for, for witness and for service. And from, uh, you know, suddenly there's three opportunities there to teach the word of God. That's, that's how God blesses. He opens doors and gives opportunities because there's capacity to do it. There's that willingness to do it. There's that eagerness to do it. It may also involve materially. The crops, a bunker, bumper year. Or investments doing very well on the stock market. Uh, neither one of those examples are very true this year <laughs> in, some, in some things. It may be a material blessing. It may be extended periods of good health. But the primary thing that we need to stay focused on is that when our attitude and our thinking is right with the Lord, He gives us opportunities for service for Him. And He makes it effective. And with our spiritual advance comes a greater understanding of his sufficiency, of his care, of his provision. With that confident, reassuring, absolute sense of peace that he cares for me. That what I'm going through and what happens in my life matters to the Lord. Well, let's go to verse 8. We won't be able to cover a lot of it tonight, but we want to start it. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now, he's commanded us to humble ourselves under the ruling hand of God. He's emphasized the necessity of you and I to be cognizant. Now he's going to emphasize that you and I need to be very cognizant of the fact that we have a real enemy. Satan. And his one purpose is to neutralize our lives spiritually. Now in the first phrase here, he says, be sober, have a sober spirit. That is, be serious about your spiritual life. Have discernment. Look at it seriously. Take your spiritual life as a serious thing. That doesn't mean an attitude of no humor, no. No, it's, it's important and you need to recognize that your spiritual life and our spiritual lives are important. The word means to be stayed, steady. Our thinking is right. We assess things from a spiritual viewpoint. We look at it in light of biblical truth. That fulfills the principle of casting our cares upon Him. See, when, as we cast our cares upon Him, what we're beginning to think of what? Things from his perspective. Then in the latter part of the verse, or the, of that first phrase, he says, be on the alert. If you and I think that Satan is not an active 
enemy, we're in la-la land spiritually. His schemes, his darts are always being hurled in our direction. If some of them don't hit us, it's the grace of God. But they're aimed at us. He's always on the attack. You know, Peter had good grounds to say that. He had learned from Paul, perhaps. He was thinking at this time. Remember when Paul wrote to the Ephesian church? Or churches in that area? In chapter 6, verse 10 through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord, the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers. These are all satanic uh, hierarchy. Angelic, demonic hierarchy. Against rulers, against the powers, against the forces of this darkness. Against spiritual forces and wickedness in the heavenly places. Peter's saying, look, there needs to be a, a... an awareness that we have a very, very real enemy. And we better cast our anxieties upon him because he knows what he wants to accomplish. He wants to neutralize us as a believer. And I think a good thing to, to here is to think of this passage in terms of neutralization. Render us useless. Not devour us and destroy us, annihilate us, because he can't do that. But he surely wants to, we'll use the term, dead in the water. Your rudder's broken, no, no wind, you know where to go, no sail. Well, you know, Peter, Peter knows what that is. He experienced it. And we'll get to that. But before we do, he says, look, you've got to have Two basic attitudes. Soberness of mind and alertness of mind. You must realize the enemy is for real. And if you don't take him seriously, he'll gobble you up. What did Jesus say to the Pharisee year of your father? The devil? <laughs> John eight forty four. Huh? Now, once you've trusted Christ as Savior, you're no longer, Satan is no longer your father. But now you have an enemy. (laughs) Now you have to have a different attitude. Your spirit must be one of soberness, nephro. You must have, be alert or vigilant. Gregoreo. Active imperatives, heiress, you, me, each of us. Not the other fellow, not the one sitting by us. Not the husband, the wife, the son or the daughter, the grandma or the grandpa. But each of us must have an attitude that is serious concerning our spiritual lives. And diligent, not frivolous, vacillating. Thinking one thing one moment and then something else another moment. We can't be passive, folks. We can't be passive. We can't be careless. Peter's saying, look, there needs to be a red flag go up in your head, in your mind, when you hear things and encounter, encounter certain situations and they're contrary to the Word of God. That little flag should go up and you recognize, oh, That's against the Word of God. That's evil. And then better yet, that you would maybe have a correct answer for it. That you could have a response. But you know, what's the problem in our nation today? We don't recognize evil. (laughs) Just listen to the news if you want a dose of evil. And no solutions. Because never once is the solution spiritually based. 
Never. We just, you know, Christians today are living their lives flippantly. Not all Christians. But I, the percentage that I heard on the news this week of the millennials who have turned away from spiritual things, going to church, let's say, and any serious study of the Word of God is phenomenal. It's not even half. It's, I think it was like 80 some odd percent. Why is that so important that we learn the word? Because we have an adversary. A real adversary. And Peter's going to call him the devil. The one who throws against you. The one who is out to make you totally useless in God's service. Ineffective. Now, Peter should know because Peter experienced some things, remember, with the Lord. And we won't get too much ahead of ourselves in saying this, but remember he, had, he mentioned, Thou art the Christ. Son of the living God. What a phenomenal statement. You know, whom do men say that I am? He said, whom do you say that I am? The you was plural. He was talking to all the disciples. Peter likes to get his foot in there quickly, and he says, he did it right, didn't he? Thou art the, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then if you look in another gospel right after that, Satan is jumping all over Peter. You see, Satan doesn't bother a lot. The nonchalant, the happy-go-lucky, the uncommitted Christian. But you commit to walking with the Lord. And you will find your enemy in front of you, behind you, all around. But now remember something. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There may be a lot of potholes, but the Lord says, I'll make your path straight. And then I just love it. When we were in Psalm 23 the other day, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. That's pushing me on all the days of my life. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this time in the Word of God, for the encouragement that you give each of us, recognizing that we can cast our cares upon you, that you desire for us to have an attitude of grace, an attitude of humility, so that we can be effective witnesses for you. We pray, Father, for open doors. We pray that we might be alert. Not only against those things that are wrong, but alert to spot opportunities to present Christ to someone. Even if it's just for a moment. To plant that seed or an extended conversation where Christ becomes that which prods the thinking, that statement that prods the thinking of the individual and either leads them to Christ or to greater spiritual maturity, to desire you and to know you. Well, we pray, Father, for your blessings upon each of us. We each have our set of needs, and we're thankful that you're aware of each one. And we give you thanks that you're sufficient for our every care. Now we look forward to this coming Lord's Day, so we pray for protection and help so that we might be able to assemble together again. In Christ's name we pray, amen.